so a very good evening everyone uh, uh, so uh, we uh, i think uh, we can straight away uh, go to the lecture the second part of the lecture on louis carroll's uh, through the looking glass uh, delivered by dr anindita de welcome dr anindita de to the second day and the second and the final day of your lecture uh, so i think we can well begin the lecture and it's all yours now yeah thank you dr monalisa borgohai and a very good evening to everyone so i think uh, without any further delay i should start so let me first share my screen Yeah, is it visible? Mm, yes, it is. Okay. Um, let me go to the. So yesterday I stopped here. Yeah, is this a slide visible? Yes, yes, it yes, is visible. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, so we start uh, the last part, the climax, the last four chapters. And uh, since uh, 10, 11, and 12, the th last three chapters are very small, very short chapters. So uh, 9, 9, 10, and 11, I have to club together. And then uh, the last chapter. So uh, the ninth chapter is called Queen Alice. Uh, so Alice is now the queen. Uh, queen and she's she has a crown on her head and the 10th uh, chapter is called shaking okay because you know she uh, holds uh, the red queen and she gives a, a shake to the queen and uh, the, the 11th chapter is called waking because alice uh, wakes up and she comes back from her dream okay uh, so now in the ninth chapter, uh, what happens is uh, after realizing that Alice has become a queen, you know, she finds herself in the company of the uh, red queen and the white queen. So now the two queens are very jealous because Alice herself is now the queen. So they start harassing her and uh, they start uh, questioning her relentlessly. Uh, telling her that she cannot be a queen until and unless she goes through some kind of examination. So what they do, they ask her very strange and peculiar questions about uh, manners, etiquettes, uh, about mathematics, all absurd nonsense, and uh, about the alphabet system and how to make a bread, uh, about languages, etc., etc. And uh, remember that Alice is only a seven and a half year old girl. So after quizzing Alice uh, for some time, both the Red Queen and the White Queen, they, they fall asleep and they start snoring. And this sound of snoring uh, seemed to Alice uh, like, uh, you know, like, uh, like, uh, like music. Okay, and she gets carried away by the sound of the snoring because that uh, look uh, that appears to her like music. So she's distracted. And while she's distracted, you know, suddenly, inexplicably, uh, both the queens vanish. So now when Alice looks up, uh, she finds herself uh, suddenly standing in front of a door. And uh, the door reads Queen Alice. Uh, the, the door has a label and it is written Queen Alice. So when Alice bangs the door, it does not open instantly. But uh, when the door finally opens, Alice uh, discovers that uh, there's a party going on inside. And this is the party, you know, thrown by the kings and the queens, both the kings and the queens, in honor of the new queen, Queen Alice. And uh, now as uh, Alice, stay, uh, you know, becomes a part of, the, of this uh, party, uh, she sits uh, on the dining table 
a huge dining table with all kinds of food items there and all the guests sitting around and the two queens uh, they toast they make a toast and uh, alice after the toast is made alice uh, gets up to you know thank and uh, to give a, a thanksgiving speech but suddenly she realizes you know alice uh, tugs at the tablecloth and suddenly she uh, you know sees that there is utter chaos there is uh, utter chaos everywhere and uh, you know everything starts flying here and there the candles on the table they fly the utensils they fly here and there and there is utter chaos uh, everywhere nothing is in order so now you know alice uh she becomes very irritated and she thinks that it is uh, the uh, the red queen who has created this chaos so she becomes very angry and she catches hold of the white queen and as she uh, catches hold of the uh, the red queen sorry the red queen and as she catches hold of the red queen the red queen suddenly you know reduces shrinks she becomes uh, like uh, the size of a chess piece and uh, uh, alice is so uh, angry that she keeps uh, she holds the uh, red queen and she shakes the queen okay and as she is shaking the queen uh, she finds that the queen the red queen transforms into her pet kitty the black cat okay and after that immediately after that alice realizes that she has woken up she's awake she's no longer dreaming so and then uh, alice you know she, when uh, she wakes up from a dream she becomes very angry and she scolds her pet uh, the black cat kitty for waking her up and then you know she she you remember that in the first uh, chapter itself i told you that uh, alice had a chess board in uh, her room uh, so what she does she gets so angry she, that she picks up the red queen a chess piece on her uh, from the the chess board in her room in the real world and uh, she you know she's uh, she tries to convince her pet that she is she was actually the red queen okay and uh, i already told you i already mentioned that uh, alice has the tendency to talk to her pets so she starts convincing uh, kitty that she was the red queen uh, in her dream she was actually the red queen and she has not transformed into kitty and then she suddenly uh, sees snowdrop the other you know the other uh, kitten the white kitten and alice tells that uh, snowdrop was the white queen and who could uh, the other the, the the adult cat be dina dina uh, kitty and snowdrop's mother so she assumes alice assumes that dina must have been uh, humpty dumpty because dina is a very you know very fat uh, and huge cat so she assumes that Diana must have been uh, Humpty Dumpty. Okay. Then the last chapter is which dream did. So now the question is whose dream was it? The final chapter, uh, you know, uh, uh, poses a question to the reader whose dream was it actually? So Alice is wondering, you know, in this last chapter, Alice is wondering whose dream was it actually who was dreaming on the one hand she believed that she might have been dreaming it could have been her dream and on the other hand uh, she she th she thought that it might have been the dream of the red king okay because since uh, in one of the chapters she was convinced by uh, the twiddle's brother that uh, alice was a part of the red king's dream so you know uh, she uh, really cannot decide whose dream it was so now uh, it's an open you know situation the narrator concludes the chapter by asking the reader uh, who they think could have been dreaming so the narrator 
questions the reader uh, that uh, was it the dream of uh, Alice or was it the dream of the Red King or somebody else? So, and you know, the chapter ends with this question uh, followed by a poem uh, about, you know, summer, eternal summer, about dreaming and the wonderland. So, you know, uh, you could say that uh, this is what uh, literature is all about. And I always believe that, you know, uh, you get, you will get the true essence of literature only when you are about to interpret it uh, yourself. Okay. What I'm telling you through this lecture is my interpretation, my way of looking at this novella, the narrative, the story of Alice, okay, in the looking glass world. But, you know, even the, uh, even the narrator, uh, you know, um, tells uh, the author to make his or her own interpretation. Uh, if it was a dream, whose dream was it? Okay. And on this note, the uh, story ends. Uh, so now uh, I have uh, taken you through the 12 chapters. So now, as I promised you yesterday, I will be discussing uh, next uh, the motives, uh, the symbols, uh, not all, some, uh, you know, and uh, and lastly, the themes. So, um, according to me, you know, I found uh, four motives. Now, I, uh, if you remember, I told you that uh, a motive uh, is a dominant or, uh, you know, frequently occurring or recurring uh, idea, it could be any idea, it could be a design, it could be uh, any object, anything, or a piece of music, etc. in any piece of art or uh, literature. So here we have these four, you know, aspects recurring over and over again. So the first one is inverse reflections. Okay. So uh, uh, what uh, assumption, uh, you know, so assumptions, I would say, Alice makes about her uh, surrounding or environment are reversed in the looking glass world, okay? So whatever assumption she has made about her, you know, life in the real world uh, is reversed in her dream world, in the looking glass world. And uh, we find that, you know, outcomes precede events, okay? Outcomes, that is, results come before the events. Uh, as we have seen that, uh, you know, uh, when uh, the, the cake was first passed around and then only it was cut, okay? It is just the reverse of what we do in our uh, normal uh, life. We first slice the cake and then pass it around. But in the looking glass world, outcomes uh, precede events and uh, destinations are reached by walking backward. Okay, when we walk to a destination, we walk forward. But here, you know, if you have to reach your destination, you have to, you know, walk in the opposite direction. If you have to go to right, you have to go to left. If you want to go to the left, you have to go to the right. Forward means backward. Backward means forward. So it's in reverse direction. And then uh, the characters can think, uh, you can remember the past as and have a knowledge of the future. And uh, so these strange, you know, phenomena uh, challenges uh, the way Alice thinks. Uh, and in some cases also expose the, you know, the arbitrary nature of her understanding of her own world, okay? Uh, so Alice in her real world is confused about certain things and these things make an impression on her subconscious mind, which she dreams in her uh, yeah, yeah, um, and uh, finds her in the looking glass world. So these are all, you know, the, uh, you could say, the uh, round, uh, you reversed uh, order of thinking in the, uh, from the real world to the looking glass world. Uh, then the next motive is the motive of dream. Okay. So uh, the first chapter itself uh, begins by, you know, Alice uh, falling asleep. And, uh, uh, and uh, these, uh, the fantastical adventure 
uh, you know, occur in her dreams. Okay. Uh, so Alice falls asleep near the fireplace with Kitty on her lap, and then she starts dreaming about this fantastic world, the world of the looking glass. And the story follows uh, Alice uh, through the various episodes uh, of the looking glass world. And uh, we experience along with her the adventures through her impressions of the looking glass house, the, the chess game, and her quest uh, to become a queen herself. Okay, and the, um, the characters and scenes, uh, um, I mean, uh, that she encounters uh, exist as a, you know, combination of her memories and impressions of her waking world, uh, that is her real world, and, you know, the, <clears throat> the random and illogical, you know, uh, impression her uh, thoughts, random thoughts, or uh, the impressions that she had of her real world uh, in her dreaming mind, okay? Next is uh, uh, the motive of uh, chess. So the game of chess that Alice uh, participates uh, becomes the, you know, the organizing mechanism for her adventure in the looking glass world. Now, Alice's journey, you know, closely follows the rules of a traditional game of chess, OK? So whatever movements Alice makes or the other characters make, uh, follow the, you know, the, the rules of the, uh, the general rules of the game of chess. And the perspectives and the movements of the individual characters also correspond to the movements of the respective chess pieces. So uh, we find that the uh, red and the white queens have an unlimited view, okay? As we know that in a game of chess, the queen uh, has unlimited, you know, movement. Uh, the queen can go any, uh, any direction and there is no limit. And uh, since the queens can move uh, in any direction and as many spaces as they want in a single turn, so Alice finds the red and the white queen, you know, moving everywhere. Uh, and their mobility does not have any restriction. Uh, but uh, the red and the white king can move only one space uh, in any direction, just like, you know, uh, the, the movement of the king in a traditional game of chess. Okay, and uh, uh, therefore, me, the kings... Yes. Uh, I think yes. uh, we have the same problem again, like uh, yesterday, the screen has gone blank. Uh, yeah, the screen has gone blank. We can't see anything. So I think it's the same problem uh -huh. like uh, like okay. yesterday. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, but uh, I didn't do anything. Uh, yeah, I think uh, there's some technical problem, I guess, uh, because the screen has gone blank yeah. like yesterday. So shall I end it and okay. restart okay. again? Okay, okay. Okay. okay.
you now. Okay. So I'm sharing the screen again. Yeah, yeah. I think there's some technical. I mean, problem yeah. with the network today. Uh, yeah. There's no BSNL. There's no BSNL network. Only Geo is working. Okay. Can you see? Can you yes, see my yes? Yes. yes. It's okay. visible, yes. yes. So um, sorry for the interruption. So no, no, sorry it's for okay. This. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, please continue. Yeah. Okay. So is it visible? Is my screen visible? visible yes. 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 Okay. My, yeah. Your screen is visible. Yes. Okay. Fine. All right. So, um, uh, so I was uh, talking about uh, the perspective of the queens and the king. Uh, so the queens have, you know, uh, more uh, mobility, uh, whereas the kings do not have much mobility, just like the chess pieces in a traditional uh, game of chess. And uh, Alice also, like a pawn, can only see one square ahead of her, okay? When she's just an ordinary pawn, she can just see one square ahead of her, just like a pawn in a chess uh, game. But when she becomes a, you know, a queen, uh, when she uh, reaches the eighth um, square, she can see the entire chess board, okay? Because she has now full mobility like a, a queen in a chess game. So now, as Alice moves to take the red queen, it results in a checkmate, okay? When Alice grabs, uh, catches hold of uh, the red queen, it is a checkmate to the red king also. There, thereby, the game of chess ends there abruptly and Alice wakes up, okay? So then the fourth motif is the train imagery. Uh, so we have already uh, you have seen that, you know, Alice boards a, a train, a carriage, okay? And uh, this train helps her to move, uh, uh, you know, several uh, um, I mean, squares forward. Okay, she, they, when the train jumps over uh, the uh, uh, brook, uh, what happens is that Alice is allowed to skip the third square and she uh, lands on the fourth square. So this is something which happens unexpectedly. So therefore, this train imagery, you know, uh, suggests uh, the irreversible and the unstoppable uh, movement of Alice towards adulthood. Uh, okay, and Alice becomes a subject uh, to this in her journey uh, uh, through the, you know, the, the looking glass world. So the train imagery uh, indicates Alice's journey forward, you know, towards her, her uh, adulthood, towards becoming a, a woman. So now uh, we will look at the symbols. Uh, now, uh, symbols very briefly are, you know, objects, uh, ideas, or you know, it could be any people, any individual, events, etc., uh, that uh, represent uh, something beyond uh, the literal representation or the literal meaning of these ideas, you know, objects, etc. Okay, it has a, a deeper meaning. So, the first sim symbol is the uh, rushes. Uh, rushes. I already told you yesterday. They are uh, some aquatic plants. Uh, you can see it in the image here. Is my screen visible? Hello. Yes, Yes, okay. So I think you can see uh, the image of the rushes. Uh, so these are aquatic plants and they are seasonal, okay? They are not perennial, they are seasonal. They come and go. They grow uh, in the water as well as on the riverbed. So 
uh, in the fifth chapter, I have also, you can read the quotation here from the fifth chapter. I've just picked up one quotation here uh, from the, the chapter Wool and Water. And, you know, uh, this uh, rushes uh, that Alice, you know, she's very fond of these rushes as she is boating through the river. Uh, she picks up this rushes and she puts it uh, near her feet. And uh, she's mesmerized by uh, the uh, smell, the sweet scent of the rushes. Okay, so uh, these, uh, you know, the, these uh, rushes fade rapidly. Okay, I told you that they are not perennial. They don't uh, remain there forever. So they fade uh, very fast. And the sweet scent of the rushes also pass off very fast. So this corresponds actually to the, you know, the fleetingness of the memory of a dream after a person wakes up. Or this, you, this, uh, this could also mean that the rushes, you know, symbolize uh, uh, Alice's fleeting childhood, okay? So the next symbol is Alice's crown, okay? So again, I've picked up, you know, from chapter nine and 10, uh, you, uh, this quotation uh, about Queen Alice, you can just read it. Uh, so, uh, the, this, uh, so when uh, Alice uh, reaches the eighth square, Alice uh, suddenly discovers that there's a crown on her head uh, and she realizes that she has become a queen. Now this queen, uh, this cr uh, crown is very big and it's very big and awkward. And Alice does not know how to fit this uh, uh, crown on her head or how to walk with this, you know, how to balance this when she walks. So uh, this is the, you know, this is the unsatisfactory experience of Alice as a queen. And uh, this uh, Alice, uh, Alice becoming a queen uh, symbolizes her stepping into adulthood, which she, uh, uh, which is not a great experience for her. Okay, she might have wanted to become a queen, but now uh, when she becomes a queen, she finds that is not a very good experience. Okay, and uh, Alice uh, is just as lost in the uh, looking glass world as a queen as she was a pawn. She doesn't know, you know. Uh, what to do, what exactly to do. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, it's a very awkward uh, situation for her. And uh, this, this crown uh, signifies her uh, queen, queendom uh, as well as her stepping into adulthood. And, uh, uh, and uh, the, the author, Lewis Carroll, suggests that, you know, uh, Alice is as lost as a child as she uh, is uh, in this, uh, uh, in the, I mean, uh, in her uh, step towards adulthood. Okay, she's lost in both the phases. Uh, then the next symbol is uh, uh, the poem, the, the poem, the nonsense poem, Jabberwocky. Okay. Uh, so please read the quotation from chapter one. I've given it here. Uh, so uh, as you already know that uh, Alice encounters this uh, nonsense poem, uh, Jabberwocky, after she, you know, climbs into the uh, looking glass uh, world in the looking glass uh, room, the first room uh, in the looking glass world. And uh, first she initially thinks that it is uh, written in, a, in some different language. But then later on, she realizes that uh, she could read the poem uh, if she uh, held it up to the mirror because it is written in, a, in an inverted manner. Because you remember that uh, this is a book from the inverted world. So as the poem comes up again and again uh, throughout the story, it continually you know, plays with the rules of the looking glass world and in general proves uh, uh, the the stories, you know, the narratives, uh, broader point that literature uh, or any piece of art for that matter, any piece of literature, it could be a, a novel, it could be a, a poetry, uh, 
it could just you know be fun uh, it need not be serious always okay it uh, doesn't need to you know make sense all the time uh, and uh, uh, jabberwocky the poem jabberwocky represents uh, the idea that uh, uh, you know uh, the poetry or literature uh, doesn't need to be always you know sensible uh, in order to be enjoyed in order to be entertaining uh, because uh, you know nonsense can be just as fun as uh, serious literature okay okay then we will come uh, to the last part of my talk so i will discuss the themes quickly so that we have enough time for your queries uh, so uh, the first uh, theme that uh, I find is uh, a youth identity and growing up. Uh, <clears throat> so Alice uh, joins the game of chess first as a pawn, uh, but she aspires to become a queen. Okay, so she symbolically starts uh, to come of age. Uh, when Alice becomes a queen, that means she's coming of age. Okay, she becomes, she's stepping into her adult world. And eventually she reaches a version of adulthood uh, when she's a crowned queen. However, Alice's uh, journey makes it clear that, you know, navigating childhood on the way to adulthood is a very <clears throat> lonely process. And, uh, you know, the end goal, you know, that is the phase from uh, childhood, then the transformation to adulthood is a very lonely process. And, uh, and it is also a questionable one. Do we really enjoy adulthood? Uh, it is, uh, we often question, uh, you know, that uh, was, uh, was our uh, childhood better than adulthood? Uh, so uh, this is one pertinent question here. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the narrator uh, several times mentions about, you know, Alice's sister, though we never meet her. And we find that, you know, Alice is a very lonely child and she is uh, um, most of the time uh, try, trying to talk to her pets. And... Uh, and uh, this could be an indication that uh, she has all these imaginative, you know, uh, things going on in her mind, and she dreams it when she falls asleep. And even uh, though some of the characters uh, in the Looking Glass world, like the Gnat and the White King, uh, try to provide some, you know, companionship and uh, support to Alice, but you know, it is not that effective. And Alice has to navigate through the chessboard, that is through her journey towards uh, becoming a queen all alone. Okay, so the, this narrative, <clears throat> you could say, uh, suggests that, you know, uh, identity goes two ways. It is both personal, uh, it is something personal uh, to an individual, um, and it also helps other people you know, fit that individual into their conception of the world. Um, so uh, when Alice crosses the eighth square, Alice discovers that there is a crown on her head, okay, signifying her royalty, but it is not a comfortable feeling. And uh, Alice, you know, struggles to figure out how she should move about with this huge crown on her head. And, uh, Considering the party in honor of Queen Alice, you know, in the ninth chapter, the party is uh, thrown in honor of Queen Alice. It is, uh, <clears throat> it is uh, metaphorical of her adulthood. Her experience um, suggests that while, you know, adulthood may look desirable to children, you know, when we are kids, when we are children, we desire adulthood. We want to grow up fast. Uh, but actually, you know, childhood may simultaneously uh, seem, you know, uh, inducing a lot of anxiety, 
and difficulty, different kinds of difficulty that we face during our childhood. And uh, uh, when you are a child, you say uh, your childhood is full of anxiety and you think about growing up. And when you grow, you, when you really grow up, you, you know, you desire to get back your childhood again. So all these things, you know, uh, are represented throughout the narrative. And uh, therefore, uh, when Alice uh, finally wakes up, uh, Alice, you know, she happily resumes chatting with her cats uh, with wonder. And she's also very nostalgic about her time that she had spent in the looking glass world. Then, uh, then the next theme is about adulthood and the adult world. Okay. So <clears throat> as we go through the chapters, we find that, you know, except Alice, uh, most of the characters look and behave like adults. But, you know, somehow uh, we, will, uh, we feel uh, that the adults uh, in the story are uh, caught up uh, in pointless, you know, philosophical or logical arguments uh, regarding silly rules and such things. Okay, they are all the time arguing or making uh, philosophical, you know, conversation about rules. And uh, Alice uh, very often uh, seem uh, seems to be more competent or more mature than the adult characters. Uh, for example, when uh, Alice uh, meets the Red Queen, uh, she realizes that the, uh, the adult world isn't, uh, is not going to live up to her expectation. Uh, you know, looking at the behavior of the Red Queen, she knows that uh, what she expects is not going to materialize. And that part of reaching childhood is having these expectations, you know, about the world dashed, you know, she knows that her expectations are not going to uh, be materialized. And again, when she meets the White Queen, uh, the White Queen explains to her that her life exists in both directions, that she can remember both the past and the, uh, she has knowledge of the future. Uh, so, and the White Queen also gives an example of outcomes before uh, the uh, events, okay? When she gives an example of the messenger being imprisoned uh, before even committing the crime. And when Alice, you know, Alice uh, makes a very, you know, matured question by questioning this ethics, okay, of uh, punishing someone even before committing a crime. Okay, therefore, from this, we can uh, say that uh, even though Alice is just a child, uh, she is more observant and she is more competent than the adults around her in the uh, looking glass world. And uh, both the kings and the queens, both the white king and the red king, then the white uh, queen and the red queen, they are all four of them, they are lazy, they are incompetent, they are disarrayed and very childish and hence, you know, when Alice becomes the uh, queen, uh, the kings and the queens cannot offer her any enlightenment or you cannot, uh, I mean, they cannot offer her any advice on how to, you know, assume her queendom or how she should behave or what she should really do as a queen. They could not advise her because they were themselves a very incompetent. And uh, here, uh, you know, the, the author, Lewis uh, Carroll, also suggests that adulthood really isn't that uh, noble of a goal, okay? Uh, we might think, you know, adulthood to be uh, a privilege, but it is not like that. And it's just as confusing as childhood, okay? And it doesn't provide anyone any benefits uh, from, you know, other than, you know, adding only uh, problems in uh, an adult's life. So <clears throat> adulthood in uh, this narrative is a uh, little different from, only slightly different from childhood, 
and uh, uh, you know the stakes are higher uh, and uh, you know privileges always come with stakes privileges always come with uh, risks so, uh, and so in this way you know the novel takes issues takes up the issues of uh, ruling or governing a society uh, and uh, and also reminds the reader that the rules of the real world are in many cases uh, just as silly as uh, those that work in the looking glass world. So actually the author is, uh, you know, uh, satirizing the rules of governing in the real world by, you know, uh, making the rules look very inverted in the looking glass world. And uh, the last theme is uh, sense and nonsense. Uh, so in the looking glass world, you know, nonsense is the norm, okay? Uh, while also suggesting that attempting to make sense out of nonsense is normal, but it is a futile. We always try to find some uh, sense uh, out of nonsense, but it is a futile endeavor because nonsense doesn't mean anything. And there is no, uh, you know, there is no requirement to uh, try to decode nonsense. Okay, so from the moment uh, Alice, you know, crawls uh, through the mirror into the uh, looking glass world, uh, the, you know, the narrative uh, asks the reader, uh, reader uh, to, you know, uh, suspend uh, their belief. You know, we are asked to, even though we know that, you know, this world will never exist and all this nonsense will is not actually there. It makes no sense. But we are forced, just like Alice, we are forced to suspend our disbelief. You know, what we know about the willing suspension of disbelief. So we are forced to suspend our disbelief even though we know it's not true for uh, for that uh, for a uh, temporary period we love believing in all the nonsense and all the you know uh, all the fantastical things that happen in the looking glass world so in the looking glass world we find that uh, the flowers talk uh, have the, uh, the flowers have the ability to talk then there are nurse nursery rhyme characters and uh, chess pieces which are animate they have life and it's a world which is an impossible world according to our real world okay but anything is possible in that uh, impossible world and uh, alice uh, recognizes that you know she doesn't have the knowledge to understand whatever is happening in this looking glass world she doesn't have the ability Therefore, she starts questioning all the characters, but the characters cannot uh, give her a suitable answer. Okay, so uh, therefore, you know, Alice is uh, uh, overwhelmingly unsuccessful in interpreting what she sees. She cannot understand, she cannot uh, interpret what she sees. And uh, that is exactly the point of the narrative. Just like Alice cannot interpret what is going on around her, we need not, the readers need not interpret, uh, we need not uh, interpret the nonsense. We, need, we did not try to find sense out of the uh, nonsense. And, uh, and in many cases, you know, Lewis Carroll uh, uses, you know, nonsense to let uh, readers, you know, joke and uh, poke uh, fun at the traditions that we follow, the uh, the school of thoughts that we believe in she's trying to make fun of all the traditional beliefs and the school of thoughts that uh, we think is uh, so you know so secured and so strong uh, uh, so and uh, on a closer inspection you know it is uh, these uh, th school of thoughts are as silly as the fact that the uh, white knight was falling off the white horse, okay? Even though the white uh, knight believed that he was a very skillful rider, but he was falling off the horse. So uh, uh, 
Carol also, you know, makes fun of all the, you know, philosophical thoughts, the school of thoughts that we think is so correct and, uh, uh, you know, we are secure, but actually they are as funny, they are as silly as the, you know, the white knight's predicament, okay? Uh, uh, so uh, you see that uh, Lewis Carroll again and again, you know, makes a case uh, that, you know, literature, uh, whether it is logical or not, whether it makes sense or not, it should be, it should uh, be fun for the readers, okay? And uh, uh, it was uh, Lewis Carroll, uh, along with others who, for the first time, you know, uh, invented the genre of nonsense literature. So he was trying to tell everyone through uh, Jabberwocky and all the other uh, nursery rhymes that he uh, wrote about in this work uh, that, you know, a piece of literature can just be fun, can be nonsense and can be fun. And, uh, you know, the, um, the reader, uh, the, the reader is free to choose uh, whichever way he or she wants to, or whichever way he or she wants to interpret the, the work. There is no one way of interpreting. You are free, the reader is free to interpret uh, whatever he or she believes in, uh, in any uh, piece of literature. Uh, so the last slide is uh, a summing up. So uh, what is the major conflict of this uh, narrative, major conflict means what is the problematic of this narrative? So the problematic is that uh, Alice wants to become a queen. Okay, Alice desires to be a queen. And uh, in this a massive uh, chess game in the looking glass world, that is the major conflict, you know, how Alice uh, transforms from a pawn to a queen. And then uh, the next is the rising action. Rising action means, you know, when the action is at its peak. So what is the uh, uh, rising action? Alice, you know, moves forward in her um, uh, desire to become a queen, okay? One square at a time. And she advances you know, through the entire chessboard till she reaches the, the eighth square. And then the climax is when Alice finally becomes the queen. And then uh, the falling action. Okay, when uh, the action takes a dive after the climax is the anti-climax. The anti-climax is that uh, Alice, you know, catches hold of the red queen and starts uh, shaking her. And uh, she uh, gives a, uh, when she uh, catches hold of the red queen, the red king is in checkmate and the game ends uh, abruptly and Alice comes back to her real world from her dream world. So that is all about uh, the story of Alice in uh, the looking glass world. So that is all. Uh, so thank you. And uh, now we can uh, uh, take some questions. Uh, yes, participants, you can just unmute yourself and uh, if you have any queries, you can directly interact with ma'am. Yes, anyone? Any confusion, any clarification, you can ask me. And uh, and I think that uh, you should read this, you know, this uh, uh, little book, a very thin, uh, you know, book, which you can finish in two days. Reading the text is very, 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 very important. The most important thing, actually, <laughs> it's reading the text. Yeah. Yeah, only then they'll be able to understand, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. And when you read yeah. the text, you don't have to search for any other reference, actually. Yes, exactly. Once you know the narrative thoroughly, you know mm -hmm. the characters, you can just, you know, write your own answers. 
Okay, just to initiate uh, discussion, Anandita, uh, if we consider the theme of uh, growing up or, you know, at least uh, the process of uh, moving into the adult, adult world or adulthood, uh, how do you relate that process with the game of chess or how is the game of chess, uh, uh, how we ca can we relate the game of chess with the journey of, you know, life from uh, the, the transformation from childhood into adulthood? Yeah, uh, so you see, <clears throat> Alice, yes, Alice uh, was uh, a lonely child and, you know, um, when she goes to the, and she has a chess board in front of her, okay, maybe she had some kind of aspiration in her mind. Uh, since she was uh, a, ch a lonely child, perhaps she thought that, uh, you know, it, it would have been better becoming an adult, okay, and when she... Uh, and uh, that is reflected in the subconscious, in her subconscious mind to her dream. And uh, in her dream, in the looking glass world, she's first a pawn, okay? A pawn uh, relates mm -hmm. to childhood. She doesn't have much movement there. Like any child, you know, they have restricted movement. But slowly she goes ahead, square after square. And then she reaches the eighth square when she herself becomes a queen. So there, you know, in the narrative, it is described that she has uh, no restricted movement. Her the movement is not restricted, uh, just like the, you know, the um, uh, uh, queen in a chess piece. And she can go in any direction she likes. So she has uh, uh, unrestricted mobility, just like we adults have. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that is how I think, you know, uh, childhood and adulthood are associated through this game of chess from pawn to a queen. Okay. And in the difference of mobility as a pawn, she has restricted mm -hmm. mobility, but as a, as a queen, she has complete control over, over her mobility. Okay. Participants, you can come up with your queries. I think they need to read the novel, you know, and then <laughs> digest it. <laughs> then only first, yeah, then only yeah. They, they can have come with some kind of, you know, <laughs> appreciation for the text. Yes, yes. So, uh, shall we end the session? Yeah, I think uh, if they do not have any query, it's all right. Yeah. Or participants, you can just uh, make a comment on ma'am's lecture. Yeah. How did you find it? Yeah, I would love to know whether they understood the text. Please, uh, please, un they... please unmute yourself and uh, please comment on ma'am's lecture. Do you find it useful, helpful? They have written something in the chat box. Oh, they have written... Yes, no comments. Okay, I can see some comments coming in. You can unmute yourself and say 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 it to ma'am. She she like it definitely. Good evening, ma'am. Yeah, good evening, ma'am. Uh, it was a very wonderful session and interesting too. Thank you. Okay, and thank you so much for you know bearing me for two days. No, ma'am. It was a very interesting, you know, experience for me to, uh, though, you know, uh, teaching in a classroom is much more enjoyable. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and there are no technical hitches there, so. Yeah. Yeah. And I can look at, uh, I can see your smiling faces also there and uh, <laughs> observe your reactions, your facial expressions. You can ask any, I mean, if you have any other query not related to the text, you can ask, ma'am, regarding, I mean, your academics. She would love to answer. Yes? Yes. 
I think uh, they cannot think, you know, right now. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. We are, uh, we both of okay, us are right. intimidating them. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's just a, a friendly talk. They can have a friendly chat with us. Yeah. Not a problem. Exactly. No, no, not as teachers, but as elders. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, so I think uh, we have come to an end of this session. Today's, uh, to, today's session and uh, on behalf of the entire Department of English, I express my heartfelt gratitude to Anindita, Dr. Anindita Day, and uh, I, I hope your lecture would prove to be very valuable and helpful to the students. And we hope to uh, meet you soon again sometime. Yes. And thank you so much, so much. And for the participants, uh, we are meeting again on Monday. We shall have uh, four sessions, Monday through Thursday, uh, with uh, Dr. Lulu Moriam. Um, Borgohai from uh, DHSK College, Dibrugar. And she would be dealing with two texts. Uh, first two days, that is Monday and uh, Tuesday, she would be doing Funny Boy. And uh, Wednesday and Thursday, she would be dealing with the Perloin letter. So I request all of you to be present uh, in those sessions as well, uh, which uh, would be immensely helpful for your you know, academic pursuit. So thank you all. Thank you for being a part of okay. uh, the lecture series. And Anindita, thank you once yes. again. Yeah. Stay yes. safe and take care, all of you. Yeah. A big thank you to you and to the entire Department of English, JDSG College. And also a big thank you to all the listeners today. Okay. So maybe we'll meet someday. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.